the RED 1. RED's original OG camera. Before Komodos and Raptors and Geminis, when nobody had ever released a 4K digital camera and it wasn't something that fit into your pocket. Before the DSLR revolution, there was the RED 1, released in 2007 as RED's first Hollywood style cinema camera. The RED 1 has a pretty rich history and could certainly be attributed as launching the RED brand. This was at a time when filming digitally was not considered the standard. Most Hollywood films were still shot on film. But when directors such as Steven Soderbergh, David Fincher and Peter Jackson began to embrace these cameras, the industry took notice. This time period and the release of the cameras like the Red One marked a turning point in Hollywood where it became more widely accepted that these digital cameras could produce an image comparable to film cameras, while introducing more freedom and flexibility in the way films could be made. It also introduced the world to Red Code RAW a revolutionary file format that allowed reduced file sizes while still keeping all the advantages of a non-destructive RAW workflow. Red Code RAW is what led to all the other iterations of RAW filming formats we know today, such as B-RAW with Blackmagic, RAW Lite with Canon, and Z-RAW with the Z-Cam cameras. The Red One is a piece of cinematic history. If you want to talk about a pedigree, the Red One, or its slightly upgraded successor, the Mysterium X, is responsible for some iconic films of the time. Films like The Social Network, The Book of Eli, Contagion, and District 9. The Red One originally retailed for $17,500, but that was 14 years ago. Nine newer Red cameras have been released since then. In 2021, you can pick up a Red One second hand for between $1,000 and $2,000 US dollars. Let that sink in. You can buy the same camera they used on some of the biggest Hollywood films of that time for less than any current cinema camera on the market. In fact, you can pick this up for probably less than the new iPhone 13. Time is a curious thing. What's even more curious is that the specs of the Red One in 2021 aren't really outdated. It shoots a max resolution of 4900 by 2580 or 4.5K. It has a respectable 11.5 stops of dynamic range and it films in 12-bit Red Code RAW. Your Sony FX3 and FX6 can't do that. Your Canon C70 can't do that. Judging by specs alone, if it was released in today's market, this 14-year-old camera still happily competes. It's pretty remarkable how far ahead of the game Red was at the time. So when this camera randomly popped up on the second-hand marketplace here in New Zealand, my curiosity was piqued. There are very few of these cameras left in New Zealand, so it was not something you see every day. Now, I have always been what you might call a Red hater. Why? Well because most of their cameras had always been very far out of my price range as an indie filmmaker. Regardless of the scale of my production, no reds for me. No for you. I would see my friends and fellow filmmakers shooting their shorts and features using red cameras and be red with envy. But I shrugged it off. What's the big deal? What's so great about red? It's all just a marketing gimmick, isn't it? Well, isn't it? Here was a door into the RED ecosystem that everyone talks about in a way that was going to be extremely affordable. Yes, it's a 14 year old RED, but it's still a RED and I had to know if I was suffering from FOMO or if that Sir Peter Jackson guy knew what he was talking about. So in a rush of blood to the head, I went for it and for just over a thousand US dollars, I purchased this particular RED1 package with the 7 inch monitor, 3 V-Lock batteries, the 320 gig hard drive, 8 CFast cards, follow focus and rails. My gas was activated. I couldn't help myself. I wanted to own a real Hollywood cinema camera. And hey, if it's good enough for David Fincher, it's good enough for me. So let's take a look at some footage from the Red One.
So what is the red one like in 2021? Is it something you should consider purchasing? Let's break it down. First, let's talk about the most important thing, the image quality. This is what really took me by surprise because to be honest, I was skeptical. Was this dusty old camera really going to hold up to today's standards with all the advancements in the camera world since 2007? Yes. I was kind of blown away by the look this camera produces. People have talked about the RED1 sensor and how it produces an organic, filmic quality that has been lost in newer RED cameras, which I can now attest to. It's hard to put your finger on it, but there is just something less digital about this image. There's no doubt that newer RED cameras provide a better image if we're talking about resolution, bit rates, and dynamic range. But in their constant upgrades, it's also no doubt that the image has become punchier, sharper, and yes, more digital, less like film. It looks amazing, don't get me wrong, but it feels more artificial. It has that digital edge that I personally feel is a little soulless. It's almost too good too perfect, too crisp. The red one just has something about it, that unquantifiable magic source that makes it feel filmic. I can only speculate that this is because at the time, Red's agenda was trying to match film cameras much more closely. The big criticism of digital cameras in this era is that they did not look enough like film cameras. So whatever algorithms they put into the red one sensor, they clearly had this in mind and we're seeking to prove the industry wrong. It just looks and feels like film. It feels natural. And for just a look straight out of camera, this might well be my favorite of any camera I've ever used. It just looks like a movie. And although it is a 4K image, it doesn't have that overly sharp, too crisp feeling, which I think newer cameras are always guilty of producing. The noise in the shadows is also a lot more pleasing than say the Black Magic's fixed pattern noise. This again feels organic. So the image that the Red One produces is by far the best thing about the camera, even here in 2021. I would happily film large scale projects on this camera if not for one critical issue. And that is how much light the sensor requires to get correct exposure. To say the Red One is a light monster is an understatement. It was designed to work on large scale Hollywood sets with large Hollywood lights. Don't expect this camera to perform if you can't give its sensor a lot, and I mean a lot of light. To give you an example of this, here's a shot I filmed with a 19mm vintage Vivitar lens with the aperture set to f3.5, which is its lowest f-stop. I have every single light I own turned on for this shot and pointing into the lounge and I still couldn't get enough light to expose for the red one correctly. In the daytime when you're dealing with a lot of natural light, the red one is amazing. But as soon as that daylight is gone, you better be bringing a serious lighting kit to your set if you want your image to look good. This also means that creating darker lighting setups becomes very difficult. So it really limits the way you can light night scenes. What you really need is some big HMIs to bring all your levels up as they would have done on the film sets where the camera was originally used. Slow motion. You do also have some higher frame rate options if you crop in on the sensor, increasing your frame rate as you drop resolution, uh, including 120 frames at 2K. But I found that these weren't that great as the sensor crop loses a lot of detail and that the slow motion at 2K feels very mushy and once again requires even more light. So higher frame rates aren't going to be something you would use this camera for. You however have a great range of resolutions to film in. You can film in 4.5K with a 241 crop, 4K with a 16x9 aspect ratio, 3K and 2K. Each lower resolution means you crop in on the sensor. Then there's the Red Code RAW shooting format itself, which for me was one of the things I was most interested in utilizing. Yes it is great to work with. You can push and pull your colors in post, and you can see why, even with this older version of Red Raw, it is considered the best raw codec to work in and post with. You get three different versions of Raw, RC28, RC36, and RC42, which essentially means low, medium, and high quality. I filmed most of my tests in medium quality, 
and it played back very smoothly in DaVinci Resolve with no issues. It also should be noted that because this is lower quality than the more recent versions of Red Raw, the file sizes are actually much smaller than a lot of raw footage you might film from more recent cameras. You can get just over 3 hours of footage shooting in the highest quality RC42 format from a 320 gig hard drive when filming in 4K. When this was released, you'd need an entire production studio to manage and edit this footage. Now you'll be able to edit quite comfortably on a laptop like the Mac M1. Thank you, technology. But this brings us to one of the more curious aspects of the Red One, which is its storage. It uses red branded compact flash cards, which are either 16 gig or 8 gig, and red hard drives, which are 320 gig. A 16 gig card is only going to get you between 8 to 10 minutes of footage, which means that you're relying on the hard drive for bigger shoot days. But this isn't an SSD hard drive, like say the Samsung T5s you use with a Blackmagic Pocket cinema camera. This is a slow-ish spinning disk hard drive, and it has to be Red's own proprietary version. This means two things. First, all of these hard drives are probably now 12 to 14 years old, so the likelihood of these drives failing is now getting pretty high, and will only increase as we move forward, and there is no way to replace them the camera and its accessories are no longer supported by RED. Secondly, because it's a spinning disk drive, if you were to be filming and moved suddenly or bumped the hard drive due to the spinning disk mechanics of their design, you're at a very high risk of losing some of, or potentially all of, the data on that hard drive, which really limits the style of shooting you might do when recording to it. Of course you can use the compact flash cards for more run and gun style shooting, but you're going to run out of storage on those pretty damn quick. This is where the age of the camera is its own worst enemy. The hard drive only has a USB 2.0 connection and an original Firewire connection for uploading footage, so get used to some pretty sluggish video transfer times, unless you've got a Firewire cable and connection that you can still utilize. There are still docks from OWC that come with Firewire connections, but it's definitely an inconvenience that you need to factor in. Yes, you can also get Red Ones with a Red Mag SSD module installed, but these are incredibly rare and expensive, even if you purchase one separately. In fact, you'll find these secondhand for sometimes considerably more than the cost of the camera itself, which overall defeats the purpose of buying a camera this old at this price point. The camera body itself certainly lives up to its nickname, the tank. It's all thick metal. No cheap carbon fibre here. It looks like Tony Stark's first Iron Man suit and could probably quite easily withstand a bomb blast. When the hard drive, V-mount and rails are attached along with the monitor, it's heavy as hell. How heavy? Well, the body alone weighs 4.5 kg, and with the accessories, it's probably close to double that. It was definitely made to be operated by more than one person, and if you like handheld, on the shoulder style filming, this thing is going to make you sweat. One thing to consider is that you will need a tripod that can handle this type of weight. My tripod head could barely support the camera, so just make sure yours can. The weight is actually both good and bad. On the one hand it will tire you out if you're a solo operator and slowly dissolve your shoulders and back as the day wears on, and it's hard to move quickly with it. On the other hand, that weight gives you very stable shots when you're working handheld. The weight and heft really give you a solid, smooth handheld movement that smaller modern cameras can't provide. The 7 inch monitor is great for getting focus, but its colour reproduction is pretty terrible and its low resolution at 1024 by 600 means you can't really see what the final image might look like unless you attach a second monitor which is a little more colour accurate. It has every port you could possibly need, HDMI, SDI, timecode, etc. And it has four channels of audio with mini XLR inputs. You control the camera via buttons and a dial on the back of the camera. There is also an LCD screen here. The dial on the back of my red was actually slightly broken which made it hard to change settings quickly. Overall I would say it's actually quite difficult to find certain settings and the menu system is not very intuitive. However you can make changes without issue once you understand where certain settings are placed. Just don't expect to be switching resolutions or changing frame rates in the same way you would a Blackmagic camera. It should also be noted that the fans on the Red One are also incredibly loud.
but these turn off when you begin recording. The red one came with two mounting options, a standard Cinema PL mount, and for some reason, a Nikon F mount. Did every filmmaker have Nikon lenses in 2007? Now if you have cinema lenses, then you can just use the PL mount, but more likely you'll want to utilise that Nikon mount. Not all red ones come with this mount, so try and find one that does, as it will save you a lot of money on lenses. For the cost of one cheap prime lens, I got a set of five Nikkor lenses, 35, 50 and 85mm, and a zoom lens and a slightly wider 19mm. The Nikkor lenses are one of the few vintage lenses that still provide excellent value for money. My set is sharp, wide open and very usable. You just need to remember that cine lenses don't have electronic control through the camera. You manually adjust your f-stop and focus. So the red one does not allow you any lens control through the camera's interface. This means you won't be able to control modern electronic photography lenses with the red one. You will need to use older vintage lenses where you manually control the iris, focus and zoom functions. The red one is power hungry. I believe the red brick 150 watt V mount batteries are meant to provide 90 minutes of camera runtime. Because my V mounts were so old, they'd lost a significant amount of their charge, meaning I was getting between 20 to 30 minutes of runtime before needing to swap. So, what's the verdict? Who is the red one for? Is it still relevant in 2021? I think the image quality can certainly rival modern cameras, and in the right environment, it's organic natural filmic quality is really hard to beat. But with the amount of light it requires, it is not going to suit shooters who work with minimal setups, or that many people in the budget indie filmmaker world. For me it has been a very educational experience that has definitely made me much more interested in investing in a modern RED camera, and it gave me a great taste of what RedCo RAW is really about. But it's not a very practical camera. Its size and lighting requirements make it hard for one person to operate quickly. It was after all designed for a team of people to operate on massive sets, and it's all well and good to talk about the amazing picture quality it produced on films like The Social Network, but that's ignoring the crew and resources that film had at its disposal to create that look. It's easy to buy into the mythology of what a camera like this can do, without acknowledging the difficulty of what it takes to fully utilise it in such a way. For those thinking of maybe using this as a B camera to a newer RED, sadly this is not really going to work. This camera requires so much more light than modern RED cameras that you could barely balance your exposure to match both. The RED one would constantly require more lighting which would force your newer RED into being overexposed. You would then have to light to accommodate your B camera rather than your A camera, which is not practical. All of that said, I can definitely admit that I am no longer a RED hater thanks to my experience shooting with a red one, but I wouldn't personally recommend it except for some very specific use cases. So what are those cases? Well, if you want to utilise it in a studio environment where lighting is not an issue and it rarely moves, then the red one would be a fantastic camera. If you mainly shoot outdoors in the daytime, again, the red one will provide you a great image that for me is a lot more pleasing than many newer cameras. If you roll with a team who can help you to operate the camera and light it, then the red one is still a beast. I also think for aspiring cinematographers who really want to learn their craft, this is a great camera to cut your teeth on. It will require you to learn how to light, it will demand that you understand how a real cinema camera works, and you will have to apply structure, planning and discipline to your shoots. The camera will force you to film like you would on the productions you're looking to break into. There's no shortcuts. The camera won't forgive you for not lighting correctly or trying to rush through your setups. So as an educational tool, using this camera could be a cinematographer's or in fact any filmmaker's all-in-one film school. Because if you can master this camera to consistently produce quality images, you can probably master any. Also, Let's not forget about the million dollar question when your clients ask you, can you shoot it on red? Well, the answer if you own this camera is, of course. You don't need to tell them the camera is 14 years old. It's still red, isn't it? So you can still charge that extra red money for the trouble. But ultimately, if you're a one man band or you like to shoot run and gun, the red one is not the best tool for the job. There are many newer cameras that are much easier to use and to get a good picture under even difficult and unforgiving conditions. So there you have it. 
I hope you've enjoyed this trip into enemy red territory. You know, you people are nothing like the communists they show on TV. I can assure you it will not be the last. For me, it was a fun exploration of one of their more remarkable and historic cameras of the digital era. If you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. You can also support me through watching my latest feature film, Older, for free on Amazon Prime and Tubi TV. Links in the description. And if you're looking for an affordable modern cinema camera, I would suggest checking out my review of the Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro. Until next time, I am the Savage Filmmaker, and I'll see you when I see you.